presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Additional funding provided by Idaho National Laboratory, where for 60 years the energy of innovation has lighted the way to progress in energy and national security, basic and applied science and engineering technology, and the education of Idaho's next generation of researchers. Foodborne illnesses cost Americans $152 billion last year. Learn more about food safety, its impact on agriculture, and some of the latest scientific research why what you don't know may make you sick. So get informed, stay healthy, and join our discussion. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. Last year, 76 million Americans got sick from something they ate. 5,000 people died. Besides that human toll, the issues can devastate agricultural communities. Spinach sales, for example, dropped 20%, and the spinach industry lost $350 million after one E. coli outbreak. Understanding pathogens like E. coli saves lives and industries, and we can do something to protect our own health and our family's food. Carolyn Javi Boach is a microbiologist at the University of Idaho. She directs the University of Idaho's and the IDEA Network of Biomedical Research Excellence, or INBRI. That's 12 research and educational institutions statewide that conduct biomedical research and science education. She was recently named a fellow for the American Adva Association for the Advancement of Science, and she joins me in our Moscow studio. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Joan. And of course, we want to hear from you viewers. We're experimenting a bit here ourselves instead of phone calls. Send me an email at dialogue at idahoptv.org or post on our Facebook page. That's Dialogue on Idaho Public Television. Well, Carolyn, let's, what's the most common source of food poisoning? Um, probably the most common source of food poisoning is viral, and that's really out of my area of expertise. Um, I'm a microbiologist that is focused on the bacteria, bacterial type of microorganisms. But the most common known form of um, foodborne il illness is caused by norovirus. Okay, but so your specialty is E. coli. So let me ask you, what is, what is E. coli? E. coli is um, a single-celled bacterial organism, a bacterium that we find uh, in everyone's intestines. So most E. coli are uh, very good and they do very good things for our GI tract and the GI tract of animals and birds. But they, are, they can make you sick in some cases. Yes, they can. So um, there are many different kinds of E. coli um, and microbiologists call them strains. And um, probably the most infamous strain of E. coli is the O157H7 strain. I, I think maybe one way to think about it is there are many different breeds of dog, and, but they're all dogs, and yet they have very different characteristics. And so that's the same is true for E. coli. Okay, well let's talk about the E. coli we don't want to get. Tell us about that. Okay. Okay, so there are several strains, but they're, they are the rare E. coli that can make you sick. And probably the one that most of your viewers have heard of is E. coli 0157H7, or the kind of E. coli that uh, was in the jack-in-the-box outbreak and in the recent spinach outbreak of disease. Obviously, it's a bacteria. You can't really tell if your food is contaminated. Um, that's right. Uh, the food uh, that is contaminated with E. coli 0157H7 um, or 0157 uh, smells good, tastes good, and there's no, no way for you to know um, if it is, is contaminated until you begin to feel symptoms. So how does it get into the food chain? So the source of 0157, when, when we know the source, when we can trace the source, is almost always cattle. And it turns out that cattle and other ruminant animals 
carry 0157 in their GI tract as part of their normal flora. And this kind of E. coli does not make uh, ruminant animals sick. But it does make us sick. It does make us sick. And um, so how, how does it, how, I guess, how, what does it do when it gets in the body? So um, first of all, one of the features of this form of food poisoning is that you need to uh, ingest, you need to eat the, the bad E. coli, the O157, and it takes very few cells to actually make you, make you ill. And so the, the few contaminating uh, E. coli in the food uh, will pass through your stomach, go into your uh, gastrointestinal tract, and they have the ability to attach to the lining of the GI tract and, and replicate or uh, reproduce. And when they're in the GI tract, they cause damage to the lining of the GI tract and they also make uh, a poison or a toxin that the bacterial cells uh, secrete away from, from the bacterial cell. And that toxin, also, it's called shigatoxin, that toxin can also uh, do damage to um, the cells in the GI tract and it can get into the bloodstream from the GI tract and cause uh, uh, further damage. But primarily what you see uh, when you have an 0157 infection is diarrhea. And, and that, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. The hallmark of this particular kind of food poisoning diarrhea is bloody diarrhea and the reason that the the stool is bloody is because of the damage that the 0157 is doing when it attaches to the intestinal wall and makes this poison that um, most other, all other good E. coli don't make. We have our first email. It's from Bill who'd like to, in Boise who would like to know what is an effective way to clean produce? That's a great question um, and uh, probably many of the viewers realize that uh, not only ground beef uh, and beef products that haven't been cooked properly uh, can potentially carry this 0157, but also um, vegetables can carry it when they have been contaminated with bovine waste. Um, it is a very difficult uh, uh, thing to actually wash away E. coli 0157 or many other pathogens off of fresh produce. Um, and that is because even if you wash with running water or soap or even if you do a, ble a light amount of bleach, some of the bacterial cells will remain on the produce. Um, so washing is, is not ever going to take contaminated produce all the way to something that is um, not uh, potentially uh, disease causing. Cooking will remove um, uh, destroy all 0157, but washing does not. But you should still wash your produce, right? You should absolutely still wash your produce because you're going to take down the number of um, uh, cells that are on the surface of the produce. Um, and um, there was a very large study done uh, recently to look at head lettuce and what are the effective mechanisms of uh, reducing risk of um, bacteria that could be contaminating head lettuce. And they did all different kinds of washes and they also did um, a very easy uh, procedure and that is to take off the very most outer leaves and cut the stem. And it was not the washing that was the best but was actually the removal of the very outer leaves and the removal, the cutting of the stem of the head lettuce uh, in your own kitchen and then just using the, the inner portion of the lettuce head that had the most effective um, uh, procedure for reducing the number of potentially contaminating bacteria. Okay, let's jump back in, let's jump back into cattle. That, most of your research is done on, okay. on how that, that, how the bacteria move from cattle to, to humans. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so um, 
our research really uh, falls into two categories, um, very basic research and applied research. And we're interested in understanding, the, the basic research is just understanding what's the relationship between this human pathogen and healthy cattle. Healthy cattle carry O157 transiently and sporadically. That means that individual animals are not positive for their whole life for carrying O157. And the O157 comes and goes out of their GI tract. Our basic research wants to understand that relationship. And, and we ask uh, questions about that relationship uh, just for, for understanding the relationship without knowing how it might apply to a solution. We have other research that we call applied that has a very um, specific goal. Uh, for example, some of our applied work is to develop an effective vaccine that would prevent cattle from carrying O157, or other work to understand what kinds of composting activity is required to remove O157 from cattle waste. And how, and how goes the research? Well, the research is slow, but uh, we do think that we find, uh, we find new things uh, routinely that we hope will help uh, solve this problem. The problem of O157 uh, is a very difficult one because so few cells can make you sick and perfectly healthy animals carry the organism. So it's hard to identify um, uh, the animals that may be carrying the bacteria into our food chain. Some of the interesting, very basic uh, and recent basic research that, that we've thought about uh, and tried to answer questions about involves understanding how O157 knows, is it inside the cattle's GI tract or is it outside on the farm? And so here's a very basic question. We know O157 lives outside of the animals, actually on the farm, for longer duration than it lives inside an individual animal. Individual animals are positive for about 30 days, but we can find O157 on the farm um, for months or years even. And we would like to know uh, how E. coli knows. Is it inside the animal or outside of the animal? You can imagine that for survival, E. coli would have to be turning on different genes and have very different properties when it's in the nutrient-rich, highly competitive environment of the uh, bovine GI tract compared to being out on the farm, either in soil or in water. It, it has to be devastating to the agricultural industry if, we, if you can't eventually find a solution. This, this, the spinach crops, for example, in the last E. coli outbreak, that was $350 million from one outbreak. Yes, it's, it's a very expensive um, uh, issue, and the, the cattle industry, I think, uh, has been um, one of the most amazing and most responsible industries in trying to deal uh, with uh, the safety of their product. Um, if I could go back uh, if, uh, to, to tell you something that we found out about how does E. coli know if it's inside the GI tract or outside. Sure. Um, what E. coli does is uh, a process called quorum sensing, uh, or that's what we, we call it. Um, in other words, bacteria uh, can assess their environment to decide are there many, many bacteria in the environment or are they in a, a situation where there are not very many bacteria? And so E. coli uh, can uh, sense the environment and know when, it, when they're in a situation where it's rich with many other bacteria, not necessarily E. coli, but just many bacteria. So when E. coli is in that in, uh, situation, they turn on different sets of genes that allow them to persist in the uh, bovine GI tract. We've identified with our collaborators exactly how that sensing for the bacteria work. And so understanding that very basic uh, situation may lead 
to a simple chemical additive that could be put in cattle feed that would essentially mess up E. coli's ability to sense whether or not there are other bacteria in the environment and that, that uh, uh, small amount of an, a an additive to the uh, cattle feed would prevent E. coli from actually attaching and persisting in the bovine GI tract. So there's an example of uh, the potential of basic research to contribute to solving the problem. Well, why is hamburger then more dangerous than steak? Ah, very excellent question. So it turns out that cattle carry O157 not in their muscle, but in their GI tract, just the way we carry E. coli. And so when we have contaminated uh, product, um, it is from contamination from the fecal material in the GI tract, either directly from the GI tract or fecal material that may have gone onto a hair, the hair coat during the processing or have been aerosolized through the uh, processing um, uh, procedures. So the, the O157 is falling onto the surface of the um, meat product. When you have a steak or a roast, this is a solid piece of muscle. And so if you heat that steak or roast even a little bit, and there's O157 on the outside or other contaminating uh, bac bacteria that might cause disease, that even small amounts of heating will uh, render that steak or roast safe. Hamburger, however, is uh, the inside is the outside, so there've, there have been pieces of meat that have been ground up. So if the muscle's contaminated on the outside, then when it's ground up, the inside of the ground beef is just like the outside, and so you need to heat the ground beef all the way through to the center in order to render it completely safe of 0157. So those of us who like our, our hamburgers pink in the inside are taking a risk. I think you are definitely <laughs> taking a risk. And, and whether or not it's pink or not doesn't always let you know that the ground beef is uh, safe or has been heated to the temperature that will uh, destroy O157. So the temperature has to come to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, sometimes that temperature uh, is reached and the inside still looks pink, or sometimes the temperature hasn't been reached and the the uh, color will, will look gray. So uh, the best way to be sure that your hamburgers are safe is to use a thermometer. Okay, does the microwave make a difference? Is it heating it in the microwave versus cooking it on the stove? No, um, the, the process of heating uh, is the same. So you have okay. to bring the temperature to 160 degrees. Either method, either on the stove or in the microwave or on the grill. Let's, let's talk a little bit about food safety. A lot of people can be like, oh, I know I take yeah. care of it. I know I should do this, but it really does, it really does make a big difference to take some basic safety procedures in your kitchen. So give us a couple pieces of advice. Yes. Well, probably the number one thing that you can do, not only in your kitchen, but just generally for your own health is to wash your hands properly. And, and that's something that, that many people, although they, they know they should do it, they don't do it as often as they should do it, and they don't do it properly. So the best way is to wash your hands with soap and running water uh, for 20 seconds. And the water should be warm, not hot and not cold. And the reason is the temperature of the water doesn't help remove bacteria and viruses in any way. It's the time in which you are doing the procedure of washing your hands. And much research has shown people will wash their hands longer if it's comfortable. And so it's <laughs> comfortable when the water is warm. warm. We can't get the water hot enough to make, we wouldn't be able to stand it at all to get rid of the, the bacteria or, or destroy the viruses. So, so warm is, water for 20 seconds. Is a quick wash better than no wash? A quick wash is better than no wash. Um, but uh, trying, to, trying to, to get your hands under running water with soap is the best way and you should do that before you ever handle any food, before you serve food, anytime you touch a pet, 
Um, anytime you shake someone's hand, um, uh, would all be times uh, when you could improve your own personal health and the safety of, of uh, people that you're handling food uh, by doing. Although, though some people worry that they did, it, you would just be washing your hands all the time. Is that what you really need to do? Um, uh, yes, I think that you should wash your hands quite often. Of course, you should always wash your hands after you use the restroom. Okay. Um, it's a good policy to wash your hands be the, the very first thing when you come home because when you've been out shopping or at work, you're touching many doorknobs, you're, you're interacting with many people, and you are bringing, potentially bringing germs into your home. Uh, so good policy is uh, right when you walk in the door, wash your hands. Now, are the hand um, sanitizers, an, an, are, they, are they good enough to be a replacement for washing your hands? So the hand sanitizers are very good um, in most inst instances, they will do equal removal of potential pathogens, particularly gram-positive organisms, and in many cases, gram-negatives. Um, but if you have running water and soap, that is the best way. The hand sanitizers are good, and I'll, I'll tell you um, maybe a personal story about my family. My husband is also a microbiologist, and uh, he always carries hand sanitizer in his car, in his truck, and one of the times he always uses it is after he has filled his gas tank. I think this is a time when most people think, why would it be important to sanitize my hands? But if you think down the line a little bit, you think about what most people do when they pull into the gas station, many people are using the restroom. And then they are filling their gas tank and they're handling that pump. And so that would be a time, even if you don't use the restroom, you may want to sanitize your hands, and having that hand sanitizer in your vehicle is just a great, easy way to do it right after you fill your gas tank. We have another email, um, a viewer, uh, Daryl, would like to know if, is there a correlation of increased E. coli 0157 in grain, grain-fed cattle versus grass-fed cattle? So that's an excellent question, and if you look in many test textbooks, and also, if you're reading the literature, you'll see that in many places, uh, because of, of some research that was done many years ago now, maybe more than 10 years ago, um, there is this idea out there that we could solve the 0157 problem just by feeding animals grass rather than grain. There were some early studies that were not done in cattle. They were done in test tubes in the laboratory that seemed to think that E. coli, showed that E. coli could survive better uh, in an uh, environment that resulted from grain rather than forage. Previous studies have shown that this is not true, and in fact, um, it's not going to be something so simple as what cattle eat. Um, I think most people might even think that animals that are housed in close proximity with uh, with other animals, um, uh, maybe the way you would see them in a dairy uh, where there is uh, much potential fecal contamination compared to animals in a pasture where they're roaming around in open fields, you would think, common sense would say, oh, the open fields would be better than having animals in, in close containment. But the research does not show that at all. And in fact, it's not going to be a simple solution to have animals in open pasture compared to feeding them um, in, in, in uh, containment in higher numbers. Animals in both of those situations have very similar prevalence of carrying 0157, and they're all healthy, of course, during the time that they're carrying this human pathogen. Another viewer sent an email who'd like to know, is it should I keep my cooking oil, my canola cooking oil, in the refrigerator or in the cupboard? Um, so in my kitchen, I keep my canola oil um, uh, in the cupboard, not in the refrigerator. And um, I think that that is uh, completely safe uh, in terms of um, food safety and microbiology. The reason for that is the concentration of oil is so great that uh, microorganisms can't live in the oil, in the straight oil. Uh, it would be similar for butter. 
Uh, butter microbiologically is safe on the kitchen counter. The thing that happen, can happen with oils and butter if you don't use them rapidly is they can undergo chemical changes that would um, make them have an off flavor. And that process would be slowed in the refrigerator. I see, I always thought you should keep butter as a dairy product in the refrigerator. But no. Um, actually, the, the amount of um, fat in the butter is so high that the bacteria uh, can't live in it. So uh, it's safe to keep on the countertop, especially you if you're using it pr pretty fast clip. Well, well you, learn, you learn something every day. We, got, we have just a couple more minutes before we go. And when we come back on our web extra, I'm going to ask you about the, the research that, and the Embry. And I also want to ask you about pink slime. Oh, great. So we'll talk about that when we get okay. into our web extra. But before we leave now, I, I want to ask you how important is it to have research, especially in, in you do a lot of work with young people. How important is it for those people to look at STEM, that science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education? How, how vital is that to Idaho's economy? Well, I think it's very vital to our economy, not only to Idaho, but to the entire United States and the world. Um, science is um, providing answers to many difficult questions, not just in the biomedical arena, uh, but, but in all aspects of, of our lives. And one of the things that's so important about education is to uh, learn by doing, and that's one thing that happens when um, students get to participate in real research uh, in laboratories or in the field where they're working side by side with faculty and scientists to solve real problems. It, it's fun for, for both the faculty and, and for the students, and I guess that's a characteristic of people who are in science. We like to do experiments and have fun. So, so in good for education. So in the last 30 seconds, one piece of advice to help reduce your chances of getting sick, besides washing your hands. Uh, besides washing your hands, there's many quick things you can do uh, in your own kitchen. And that would be to microwave your sponge or your dish rag. Change your dish towels and hand towels every day. Towels are cheap. Wash them on a daily basis. They are often a vehicle of transmitting uh, foodborne disease. Okay. Carolyn, I appreciate you joining us. We have run out of time. I, I appreciate yes. you being there in our Moscow studio. And I also want to thank you folks Great. for joining us. We have lots more information about food safety and the research going on at Embry and our Dialogue website. And we'll continue, as I said, this discussion on the Dialogue Web Extra. And you'll find that at idahoptv.org. Just click on the Dialogue tab. I invite you to become a friend on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Thanks for tuning in and join us next time for Dialogue. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Additional funding provided by Idaho National Laboratory, where for 60 years the energy of innovation has lighted the way to progress in energy and national security, basic and applied science and engineering technology, and the education of Idaho's next generation of researchers. Check out our website, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.